All righty, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Morgan Gargiulo from um, Qualidime and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is the second webinar in the Youth Transitions to Adult Care webinar series. Um, this one is highlighting transition versus transfer from pediatric to adult care. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So for some of you, you may not know a little bit about Qualidime, so I want to go ahead and share that with you guys right now. Um, in January of this past year, Maine Quality Counts merged with Qualidime, um, and we are collectively a mission-driven national healthcare consulting organization with multiple offices across New England. Um, we have over 35 years of experience in improving healthcare delivery, and we specialize in quality improvement, um, project management, and technical assistance, and we have served as the Medicare um, QIO in Connecticut since 1983 and the Northern New England Practice Transformation Network since 2015. Um, so next slide. Just wanted to go over um, some of the relevant information for CMEs today. We do want to let you know that um, one of today's speakers does have a, um, has the following um, information to disclose. Um, let's see. Uh, within the last 12 months. Um, there's a lecturer for Merck on Nexplanon Long Acting Contraception. Um, so just wanted to make sure you guys were all aware of that. CMEs will be available um, for participants who've signed into the live webinar. If there are multiple people watching on one computer or you've gathered in a room together, please make sure to list all of the um, people attending into the chat box so that we can accurately um, keep track of everyone that is attending. Um, we do not have se separate nursing CEUs, but you can get a CME certificate. Um, once the webinar is ended by us, the host, you will get a pop-up on your screen that will immediately direct you to the survey. Um, if you exit the meeting before we end it, you won't see the survey link pop up, and you do need to complete the survey to get the CME um, document at the end. Uh, we will send a reminder email with the link to the survey just in case you miss it um, and you have two weeks to complete that. Um, again, as I mentioned, you will be able to immediately download it after completing the survey. And if you have any questions, you can contact Danielle Ziller um, at Qualidime or, and her email is on the screen if you have any questions or problems, anything like that. So next slide. Um, a couple notes to go over. Um, all participants are in listen-only mode. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A function to ask questions, um, and we will go through them at the end of the presentation. Um, the videos or the screen size is adjustable, um, so you can add boxes, drag them around um, to whatever you prefer. Um, the presentation is be is being recorded, and we will be sharing that with all participants in a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, and again, don't forget to put the list of anyone um, joining you into the chat box so we can keep track of that. Um, so with that said, uh, next slide. Uh, this webinar is funded through a contract with the Maine Department of Health and Human Services. So I think that's it for me. I'm gonna pass it over to the speakers and they're gonna kind of introduce themselves and go over the objectives for today. Great, thank you, Morgan. So I'm John Fanberg. I'm the Director of Adolescent Young Adult Medicine at Maine Medical Center. Um, We're going to talk to you today about the concept of transition versus transferring from the pediatric practices to the adult healthcare system. Um, I am a physician at Maine Medical Center. I see teenagers and young adults 10 to 25 years of age uh, on a daily basis, 80-90% uh, of the time. Um, and so we deal with this issue as far as moving kids from one age group and one age level of practice of care to another age level. And so that's why we're talking about that today. I'm going to let Brock introduce himself and then Don as well. Hi, I'm Brock Libby. I am an adolescent and young adult provider here at Maine Medical Center uh, working with Dr. Fanberg. I just finished uh, my fellowship in June. So I'm a new addition here, and I just think it's really important for us to be talking um, a lot about this topic. It's something we really talked about a lot in fellowship. It's, it's something that we help with as adolescent medicine providers because we see young adults, but it is something that other people really uh, struggle with a lot. So that's why we're talking about it today. 
And I'm uh, Don Burgess, the medical director of the Center for Developmental Medicine at Southern Maine Healthcare in Kennebunk. Um, I too am seeing a lot of older <laughs> kids and young adults and sometimes uh, uh, have been told that I hang on to my young adults longer than I should. Um, and that's and that's something we're going to talk about is kind of when is it a good time? It may not be right at 21, but there's always a good time to do that transition. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, young adults with developmental disabilities and uh, complex medical uh, issues. Daniel, can you give us the next slide? Um, as far as disclosures, as a disclosure side, we don't have anything to disclose for this lecture, although I am a lecturer for Merck and we're not talking about their products today. young adults to gradually take care of their own care. Um, and thirdly, to recommend steps uh, for creating an office system that's going to support you in this transition to the adult care world. Kayla? No, it's me, Danielle. Um, the structure of this webinar, we've, we've done this different from a, a straight outright lecture, uh, and we found this very useful in our first webinar, so we're duplicating today. But we're going to give you a little bit of an overview of the transition change package that was developed by Quality Counts over the last year. And we're going to talk about um, the added complexity of children with developmental disabilities. And thirdly, we're going to do this through cases. And I'm hoping by the end of this that these cases bring out a couple specific points. One is hopefully you understand how to talk about transition through one case, how to integrate this into your own practice, how to use parents and office staff as partners in this process, and not all you. How to make um, help uh, young adults with disabilities understand all the same hurdles that everyone else also has, but there might be some twists to it, especially related to dating, job, sex, and more. So um, there's a difference between transfer and transition, and that's why I want to hone in on um, so a kid starts with maybe as an adolescent at 10 or 12 years of age, based on how you define it, and they gradually grow up. And as they grow up, they have different needs, both medically, both socially, uh, in their environments, the school needs, uh, their biological needs. And that accumulates to the very end point where they actually transfer. So the transfer, my definition, is going to be it's the act of actually physically going from one practice to another practice where transition is a long drawn out process that's gonna happen over anywhere from 10 to 15 years where they actually make that transfer. Uh, in the world of family medicine, I recognize that they continue seeing patients from birth to death, uh, yet I also recognize there's different tools they need to start working with as they get older, and they might actually have a transfer even within their own practice. The same for MedPeds. Next, please. The transfer is a very finite point in time, but the transition is gradual over time. And I recognize that occurs, there's lots of types of development uh, that occurs over time. It's not just one piece. We know that puberty goes at different stages and that might be the very beginning of transition, uh, starting around age eight or 10 or 12. Uh, we recognize one starts to have independence from their parents as far as socially and developmentally. Um, we recognize there's different stages of dating. Uh, you know, hold cans before you kiss, before you have sex, and it's a gradual process. Um, and same with experimentation with substances. Uh, we know there's a gradual process to the cognitive or the reasoning process or cognitive reasoning. We know you go from a very concrete thought process when you're a 10, 12, 14 year old to almost an idealism state when you're 18. And then the physical growth. You know, your body makes changes gradually over time. And the last piece of transition would be that forebrain development, which is your organizational uh, skills. And then, so this accumulates to the point where you actually uh, move into transfer from one practice to another. And when that age happens, it varies from practice to practice. Some practices uh, transfer people at age 18 from the pediatric world to adult practices. Some do it at 21, some do it at 25 or 26. Um, I see people up to age 26 at this point, um, in part because of the adolescent and young adult medicine piece. The American County Pediatrics came out with a statement um, years ago where they were uh, making 21 was the cutoff. Yet more recently, they've been uh, given a statement saying it's not the actual age, it's the services that you're supplying. And so if you're seeing 21-year-olds and 25-year-olds, you need to be able to provide the services that they need. Um, so what they framed it as, you're transferring to someone who can do adult care. 
not necessarily adult practice only. Give me the next slide. So as your transition happens, there's lots of skills that you need to develop over time as well. Uh, we like to think that maybe you start understanding your diagnosis if you have diagnoses that are medically based at age 10, 12, 13, somewhere there. And the next step would be understand the medications you take, what the names are, what they're supposed to do, what the treatments are that are involved. Or do you have allergies? Um, I'm hoping a 13, 14 year old might be able to start checking themselves in at the front desk and maybe the parent stands behind them with the insurance card or fixes whatever they said that might have been wrong. Um, I'm hoping our office staff starts talking with teenagers maybe when they're 15, 16 first and potentially then going to the parent when they can't get all the information. I'm hoping that we start providing alone time somewhere in this transition process, possibly age 12 and then on and it gets longer and more in depth as you get older. Um, I'm hoping patients start understanding their consultants that they have, what they're supposed to be doing for their health. Maybe somewhere along the way, maybe 16, 17, the teenager starts to understand how to do their own refills, how to make appointments, how to ask questions when they're not in the office, how to reach out to you. And then hopefully at about age 18, 20, 21, they start understanding something about the concepts of healthcare systems and insurances, deductibles, co-pays, and that file process. How do we package the patient to move on to the next level of doctors? Next slide, please. So quality counts tackled these questions. They tackled them for about a year uh, between 2017, 18, and they developed a change package for primary care teams. It would, would help them guide them as far as how to do transitions to adult care. And you go into those package pieces because I think that's a very useful tool that they did develop. Next slide, please. There's a lot here. And you should have re um, received a copy of this package by email in the last uh, 24, 48 hours. We will provide it to you afterwards if you did not receive it. And there's a lot of my slides as well. I'm not going to go into every word of the slide. But I outlined a number of things that you hopefully have a teenager that starts at age 12 and eventually learns before they're 17, 18, 25, before they move on to the adult world. And we outline those things in little components. So maybe you bite off one or two of them, or maybe even three of those topics every time you see a kid. Or maybe it's not you doing it. Maybe it's your MA or your room in person is doing that. Talk maybe about the diagnosis or something like that. And we developed a tool uh, that could be a process that everybody could participate with. And we developed this checkbox thing where you could put this maybe in your problem list. And so if I saw the patient one day, I talk about a topic, maybe I check one or two of the things. My MA sees them next week and they check one or two of the things. Some of these topics might want to talk about every time we see them for four or five times before they master it. Some of these topics we talk about only once or you don't even have to talk about because we know they've mastered it. We tried to correlate these with certain age gaps when it may be more appropriate than other age gaps where they may be less appropriate. Daniel, can you click once, please? Um, the biggest component or the most core piece is that first section. We've broken into four sections. Uh, knowledge of care was the most important one in my mind. This understand your diagnosis and your disease process, understand the treatments, medications, and allergies, understand the patient, family's medical history, and then this concept that you start jointly developing annual goals for self-care is so that the patient is a core part of those goal setting process and start practicing that when you're 12 and gradually mastering that as you're becoming 18 plus. Can you click once please? Uh, the second uh, section is access to care. And that would be understanding who the providers and specialists are who are involved with your care, understand how to schedule or possibly reschedule appointments so you don't no-show, as many teens will do. Understanding medications and the refill process, understand when and who to call with healthcare concerns. And then if the kid's under age 18, for some systems, you might want to set up a process where a parent can sign something that allows you to see them independently. Or if they're over age 18, having a communication process where you can actually still communicate with the parents and get a signature from the, the young adult that allows you to do that. Next slide, please. You're gonna have to click one more time. The third component is health planning. And health planning is assessing guardianship. We know that if you're gonna take full guardianship for somebody who has major development delays, it's easier to do it before age 18 than after age 18. Uh, but also to consider this new concept called supportive decision-making, the concept called uh, the partial guardianship, where a young adult may have rights to make some decisions, but not all decisions on their behalf.
and this is something that's borne out in the state laws more recently. Um, we're hoping that over the uh, teenage years and young adult years, you've covered a number of topics multiple times, if not every time, it includes substance use, reproductive health, sexual health, uh, something about media and screen use, um, oral health, that you've talked about relationships, gender, orientation, and maybe you've touched upon things like career or educational goals. And then that fourth component being the transition process. As kids get older, that's when it's time to start talking about insurances. Recognize that adult practices are very different when it comes to access, access to them compared to pediatric practices. Um, you might be a three month wait in adult practice where you can usually get in with a pediatric practice in one to two to three weeks. Understand that there's a healthcare team approach that's coming on now where it's not just me, the doctor, it's my nurse and my front desk staff and work as a, a group together. And then as they are getting older and you're about to transfer them, is making sure that your charting is ready to go so it's really easy to accept on the far end. Next slide, please. We've developed a number of tools. I'm not gonna go through every word on the page, but um, some of the tools over the next couple of pages are very useful within this transition package. And this tool is just basically a checkbox thing which you might wanna work with your staff through to make sure they understand the concept of transition as well. Next, please. We developed some policies and we developed two sets of policies. One was a transition policy. We found that it was very useful when we tested this change package among a number of clinics that the ones that did better, they felt that one of the first steps they had to do was all sit down as a team and say, what age do we transfer? Or what basis do we transfer at, out? Um, and uh, along those lines to develop a policy along those lines for parents as well. And as I mentioned, your age might be different from the one listed on this sample one. You're welcome to change these policies, touch them up, adjust them to your clinic, recognize that they were literacy checked, they've been checked against patients, parents, and providers already though. Next slide, please. And we developed a policy related to confidentiality, and this was a core piece of all healthcare um, related to teenagers that needs to be established up front. We found this useful for both parents, patients, and for the providers themselves. Next, please. There's a couple other tools within the care change package. One was some resources you might want to be aware of, and I highlighted two of them in particular. The Maine Autism Society and the Maine Parent Federation is an incredibly useful resource. resource. Um, if you have a kid with high, uh, extensive development delays, they will actually meet with a family and put together a one piece, two piece of paper of all the things that need to transfer with a patient as they're ready to move from one practice to the next. But they'll also include things like uh, devices um, such as ADLs or wheelchairs or other things that are important to that unique kid, which medical doctors might not be familiar with or might not be working with as intensively. Next, please. And the last piece thing I share with you from the change package was developed for parents. So as you have a checklist for the provider and the team that works with the kid, we also developed a checklist for the parents so they understand what should a 13, 14 year old know what to uh, be aware of as they're moving on or at the next age group. And there's one of these developed for each of the age groups. Uh, but this one talks about um, the 13, 14 year olds and what role the parent might play, what role the kid might play. I recognize these things are probably gonna be more likely looked at by kids who are older. Um, and more likely looked at by parents who are younger, um, where, they, where the kid's younger than the parent. Uh, so examples of questions that the kid or parent might be asking himself with this age group is like, do I speak for myself at appointments or do I talk with my family and doctor or to help make decisions for myself? Do I talk to my doctor during appointments without my family or parent in the room? Do I know how to explain my health conditions or disabilities to other people? Our dream with this uh, cheat sheet or instruction manual will be a parent on the way the doctor's office says to my 13 year old kid saying, hey, do you understand how to explain yourself? You want to practice on me um, before you go and see your doctor. Um, I'm warning you as you're going to visit your doctor this time that I'm going to step out for a little bit. And if my doctor doesn't offer, I'm going to offer it. Uh, and so this primes the parent to be a partner in this process. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to pass the mic to Don. So <clears throat> uh, John asked me to put together a few statistics, which um, isn't, isn't always easy to find. You can find kind of uh, statistics on uh, prevalence of developmental disabilities. 
um, kind of everywhere and they're kind of a little bit different depending on how they put their data together. But the, the accepted rate right now for developmental disabilities in three to 17 year olds is about 17% or one in six children. And that's been fairly steady uh, for a number of years. The one thing that has increased um, over the last several years is the fact that uh, individuals on the autism spectrum are about one in 59, one in 58, depending on who you, um, who you talk to. Um, so that's about 16.8 kids per thousand kids. So every year you've got a number of kids that you have to transition over that have either really complex medical things that have developmental disabilities associated with them or just have developmental uh, disabilities. And that um, kind of poses some unique challenges to uh, be able to communicate that, um, that young, now young adults um, uh, issues to a new doctor. Um, the, one, the one thing that we're all, I think, struggling with is the fact that <clears throat> what I do, which is developmental pediatrics and the group up at Maine Med as well, there is no equivalent in the adult, um, in the adult population for a physician. It really falls mostly on psychiatry to take care of some of these kids. And young adults. Um, so your your challenge is you may be transferring primary care to somebody, but you may also be have to help find them uh, a specialist that can take care of some of their medications and and things like that. Um, so a lot of the unique challenges are are diseases that um, some of the internists, especially family practice, has probably heard about them, but things like metabolic disorders. Uh, fatty acid defects, even kids with cystic fibrosis now that are now surviving into adulthood. Uh, those kids are kind of new, um, new diagnoses to some of the internists and, and some of the older family practitioners because these, these kids never survive beyond the uh, pediatric age group. And so, you know, a lot of us have become very savvy at taking care of kids with metabolic disorders and following their emergency plan, but the adult ends of things may not have as much uh, experience with that. So those are some of the unique unique challenges. And then being able to kind of figure out when somebody needs more specialty care or some of it can be managed by the internist or family practitioner. Um, and I think we, you know, and, and John and Brock may um, agree with this. Um, we tend to take care of a lot of the medical issues ourselves and then, you know, maybe consult with the specialist at the time, um, just because we're used to not having a lot of pediatric subspecialists kind of right close by. Um, and, and even some of the adult specialists haven't seen some of the diseases that, that we're now, some, some of which we're managing on our own. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any comments about some of the folks that you've um, had to transition, but those are some of the challenges we face. Hey, Don, I have a quick question on that topic before we move on. One is, um, uh, so we've seen in the pediatric cardiology world, yeah, the pediatric cardiologists are managing these kids well into the adult world, but, but there's a cadre, a small cadre of adult cardiologists that are picking up the skills. Um, and so they've almost become a subspecialty into themselves. Uh, do you think that's happening with developmental disabilities elsewhere in the country that we're going to see another, sub, uh, another fellowship train program for adult developmental disabilities at some point? Abilities, yeah. Not, I, you know, not that I'm aware of. I think across the country, everybody's having trouble um, <clears throat> with their kids and adults with developmental disabilities. But the, but the cardiologists have always kind of been ahead of the game, I think, um, in, uh, in trying to get great follow-up for their kids with congenital heart disease. And years ago, when we used to try to transition those kids to uh, adult cardiologists, they were kind of clueless as to what to do with a lot of these kids that you know have had valve um, surgery and, and baffles and all these other things, uh, shunts. Um, and now I think that you know fr spun out from that is, the, is this new subspecialty that's coming. And sometimes it's a pediatric cardiologist that takes care of adults. And on the other hand, it's an adult cardiologist that kind of takes the fellowship in, in uh, congenital heart disease. So, uh, you know, I have not seen in any of the literature or anything or any of the stuff that I get that anybody's starting this. I think a lot of developmental pediatricians are sometimes keeping kids into, like you, you guys do, you know, into 25, 26. I've got a I've got a guy with Down syndrome who's 29. He's going to be 30 this year. I'm trying to transition him as his father really doesn't want to. Um, so, um, so it's, I think it's hard sometimes to let go of some of these guys. Um, but, you know, it would be great if they would, if they would do something that was adult developmental disabilities, because I think sometimes the psychiatric care isn't as, as good as what we provided. And, you, you know, and some of these folks end up in uh, residential homes, you know, kind of small, small homes that um, 
you know, aren't like a big group setting, but there's three or four people in the home and a bunch of, um, you know, behavioral health providers and stuff. And, and that's a unique situation. It's not quite a nursing home, but it's not quite a, you know, a group home. And how do you manage those kids? And we, we get a lot of those um, where they're placed somewhere, they go with their family when they can. Um, and trying to interface with those folks is, is, is pretty time consuming because they need a lot of orders for things like meds and um, just some of the ADL stuff. Um, so I think, yeah, at some point we should, you know, hopefully we'll see people pop up that are interested in the adult developmental ends of things. Yeah, I just, I, I had an exact example of this, Don, that just happened to me, because I think as adolescent medicine providers, we're in an interesting position where sometimes when the patients become 18, they send us to us for like the, the remainder eight years that we can see them. And I had got a patient just from developmental and I'd reached out to the developmental provider and she was like, yeah, it's unfortunate that there, this, there, there's no crossover in adult medicine for this. And it's exactly as you're saying, he was being managed by psychiatry um, for his services. Thankfully, he didn't have significant impairments and was doing okay, but that was sort of the, and the patient had said this to me, she, he was like, I think that she's done with me because I'm, I've aged out. And um, it is unfortunate that we don't have that, but it sounds like in terms of that, it was the nicest transition, transfer transition it could have been. Let's move to the next slide, Daniel. So we're going to go into some cases, and this is where we can apply some of that stuff from the transition change package to the real world and what's happening amongst three different practices. So, so this is part of the reason I invited both Brock and um, Don to join me today is because I don't think we all do things the same way. And so I want different opinions along those lines. So Alex is 24. He still goes to his pediatrician. What words do you use to tell him it's time to move on to an adult doctor? Where do you send him? Brock, you want to tackle that first, or um, sure? Yeah, this is this is happening often here uh, at New Medical. We're seeing patients with the sex because that's just what adult medicine does. So I think the first question for me that I always have to ask myself going into seeing a patient like this is, do they have any subspecialists? Because that's just a part of the complete package. And if they're 24, usually those subspecialists are going to be adults. So if you have them, you can leverage that. If not, you can just talk to Alex about the fact, hey, I can see you for the next two years, but let's start thinking about a, a PD, uh, an IM doctor or family medicine doctor um, who you can transition to for the remainder of your care. Um, and you know, I, don't, I would say I don't have a, a definite script, um, but I do try to talk to patients about it. And usually at the age of 24, they know. Um, and then in terms of where I would send him, you know, I, I like the idea of a resource packet of sort of knowing um, which adult uh, docs are, are accepting new patients and are really good in certain areas. Um, you know, I just sort of think about sort of an LGBTQ, if there's, if Alex were LGBTQ identified, I'd want to have sent to an LGBTQ friendly adult doctor, but um, that's sort of my general approach. Tom, what words do you use? So I, I like the word transition. Um, so I, I use that very frequently to talk about, you know, it's time to transition over to an adult oriented provider, or adult oriented doc or, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and I start to do that around that 20, sometimes 1920, if it's my regular primary care. Um, we talk about it at 2021 20, with some of the developmental kids. Um, just saying at some point we're going to need to talk about this and I want you thinking about, you know, what kind of doc you'd like and, um, you know, we'll help you find the person that's going to be um, great at taking care of whatever issues you have. Um, so I think, you know, I like to do it gradually and I don't like to do it as, okay, you know, here's your physical and you're 21 tomorrow, you have to transfer it to somebody. Um, I think, I think that's pretty blunt. And I think some practices are even going towards, um, not even talking about it and just sending a letter saying, hey, you're 21 and it's time to move on to another provider. And I think that's probably the worst way to do it. I think a follow-up letter is helpful if they haven't done their transition just to say, hey, do you need some help doing it? Uh, but I think to introduce this as a, as a letter from the practice is, is really kind of impersonal. So, you know, we try to do it within the frame of a physical when they come in for a physical, or if it's a kid, I'm going to transfer um, you know, their primary care provider may have transferred to an adult doc, then I'll, you know, I'll check with that adult doc to see what they're comfortable managing or help them find another specialist if, if we can. But, um, you know, I think it's got to be a personal kind of discussion. And I think it goes much better if you do that. So both of you guys said gradual, which I agree with. Okay, the, the problem I hear most of the time when I talk about transition transfer process, there's nowhere to send them to. 
in the entire state of Maine, I'm here of that. Nobody's accepting patients. Um, so my solution for that piece is I buddied up with one or two people who I knew were young adult friendly. And I said, can you make a pack with me? If I send you a kid, I will package the kid really well so you know what you're getting into um, and you'll fast track them into your practice. And um, it's paid off so far. I'm careful about overusing it. I won't give my resource because otherwise everybody else will swarm the person. We'll use them. But, um, <laughs> but along those lines, to find one or two people who you can develop a relationship is a very key thing in this environment that we're having today where there's no access for most of the study. Let's go to the next slide, how about? I, I do, I just wanna say, I do like the thing that Don mentioned. I think if you have a 24 year old that is in that case, a young adult, I like the idea of sort of asking them, what are you looking for in a physician? And at that point, you've had a substantial amount of experience, maybe six years or so, or how many years you've been going to know what you look for in a doc. So I think that's a really, it's a good way to think about it and another way to sort of prepare your patients and give them what they want. Case two, Tabitha's 17 years old. Um, she's been in your practice for 12 years now. You know her well, okay? She has Down syndrome, developmental delays, and a modified educational plan. So my questions are, how do you assess what you need to do with Tabitha? How do you prepare the parent, and when, and when do you start, what age? What community resources do you make use of with Tabitha? And do you follow up to see how the transfer went after she does actually transfer? And if she's in a wheelchair or has lots of other devices, um, do you have other strategies that you also use? Want to handle that one? Um, I can go first, and Don can follow yeah, up. So I think, in. like, for me, um, if if I know them and they've been, if I've been seeing Tabitha, then you know, in terms of assessing what I need to do, I guess other than looking at the checklist that we went over, I probably would already know where they are and, and what and what the conversations have been like before that. Um, so that's really, I would sort of ask them where they're at. I would just ask them, you know, how do you, how are you feeling about this? Have you talked to, um, your other specialist about this? Given the fact that she has Down syndrome, you would think that she had um, a developmental pediatrician. So, um, that's what I, I would just ask the family. It would be a conversation. Um, and how do you prepare the parent and when do you start? Um, I would say again, I, given the fact that she has Down syndrome and developmental delays, I would probably start talking about it. I would definitely start talking about it around 14, 15, just planting the seed that that will be coming and that we'll make sure that we gather all the data we need to and make for the smoothest transition. Um, and community resources, I just think community resources are huge. So for me, as a, PD, as a PCP for this patient, I would really make sure that I had reached out to all the people involved in her care team to see where they were at and what had been discussed and what she possibly needed. In terms of community resources, I'd really lean on the developmental pediatrician. They know those so well. Um, and so I would talk to them about other possibilities. And then I'm wondering, John, do you wanna handle maybe form five? Four and five, yeah. So um, I would follow up because I think if you've known this person um, for 12 years, it's really important that the transfer or the transition goes well. Um, and you always kind of, I, I think there's always this moment of fear when they go for their first visit that like, are they going to like the doc? Are they going to come back and say it was a terrible experience and stuff like that? So we always ask them to call back to let us know how the visit went. Um, and, and wheelchair and devices, you know, I, I do think the family docs and the and the internists kind of know how to do this. So it's just a matter of making sure the chart has all the different agencies that work with the person. You know, where is their medical supply? Is it Black Bear? Is it this one? You know, who might do orthotics for this person? Um, things like that, because that, those are the things that will kind of pull people down in the very beginning, or all these orders and things that are coming across for a new wheelchair and new AFOs and stuff like that. And I do think, you know, the, the the adult docs can do some of this, but it's more at the other, age, you know, the other end of the age spectrum. Um, so, uh, but this is a, you know, this is a little easier because Down syndrome is something that they all have seen and they've all cared for. So it's it's a little easier to kind of do this transition, um, especially if there aren't a lot of behavioral issues. And, you know, at least the, the population of people that I have with Down syndrome usually aren't on a lot of psychotropic meds if any at all, they might be on something for depression, they may be on something for hyperactivity. 
Um, you know, some, there's a few select few that might have mood related issues or, uh, you know, some people do fall on the autism spectrum. So you have to kind of deal with that as a separate thing. But I would say for the most part, somebody with Down syndrome, they, they know kind of what to do with this. Um, and I did want to bring up um, just quickly, and I, I don't think we have a specific person that's just somebody who has ADHD, but um, there is a, a hesitancy on at least the internist's um, uh, side to uh, not want to do stimulants. Um, I think, you know, with the whole opiate thing and everything, they've, they've kind of uh, developed this kind of, you know, I, I really don't want to do the stimulants. I think the psychiatrist should do that. Um, where we, you know, we all manage those kids with uh, stimulants. And sometimes they're a lot sterner with their stimulants, obviously. Um, so they're drug testing every time people come in or at least on a regular basis. Um, so that's something you may have to prepare your families for, child, you know, a young adult and parent for. Um, you know, and the parent may ask for somebody with Down syndrome, well, why would you need to check my son or daughter? Because, you know, they're not taking other drugs or anything. And what they're doing is they're making sure the parent's not taking it. So, you know, there's a little bit of what happens with that. There's a little bit of trust that gets lost a little bit. Um, I think where we're probably a little more trusting because we know the family. Um, they may have policies in place that are going to be very different than how we manage things. So I try to introduce that a little bit, although sometimes people go into the same, well, I'm not going to let them do that and say, well, they may not give you your stimulants. And so I think that's something to, uh, to kind of address. Uh, right up front. As far as the age, a lot of these folks, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce it in the young teen years, but I don't try to talk too much about it at 18 because there's a lot of things going on at 18. They're either graduating from high school, you know, they may be getting placed somewhere, um, all kinds of things. So I kind of say, you know, when you're 18, we're not going to really talk about transition quite yet, but after that we will. And Don, I'm just wondering, do you have to do anything about the modified education plan? Um, Usually, I mean, it depends on, you know, the one thing that happens with a lot of kids is they can stay in school until their 21st birthday. So they can actually have an extended school experience. Uh, so a lot of times that's easy. And then they transition out of school. Um, I would say because the majority of the kids with Down syndrome are, you know, have intellectual, you know, by definition, almost have intellectual disabilities. Down, we might you know, have lost you. No. Am I back? You're back. Okay, good. Yeah, every once in a while I get a little thing that says my internet's unstable. Um, so, you know, a lot of times these, I, although I do have a couple of Down syndrome people that are going off to community college, so it's, it's quite amazing. And so you carry that plan over to the community college. Colleges are great at, um, you know, trying to do similar to what high school did or what uh, regular public school did um, as far as lost. doing accommodations. Oh. You're back. So. I, yeah. Hey, I'm gonna no, pop I, you in, guys are. I'm oh, going to pop ahead. in a question for you, Don. Um, and yep. uh, it, one thing we know is pediatric practices are incredibly paternalistic. We hold, handhold left and right. And let's say Tabitha says 21, 24, something like that. And she's moving out your door, okay? Um, what about the parents, okay? The parents turn to you and say, I, I can't tolerate all the challenges of adult world medicine trying to get through the door and getting forms filled out and stuff like that. How do you soften them on this? Um, it's it's really tough because that's the one thing I would say in real life, that's the one thing I get a lot. How am I going to do this? You know, um, and we, you know, the, the best way to do it and we're in, I, I'm glad you mentioned about having a few people that you refer to. I don't think I, I've, I had it for a while, but then somebody closed their practice down to new patients. So um, we're in the process of doing that down here at Southern Maine Healthcare is saying, how can we do a better transition? Because basically they're just leaving our practice and going to another practice. And, and we really don't have a lot of follow up and stuff, except I've had complaints about it versus, you know, good, good stories. But, um, but I think you have to support the parents as much as you have to support the individual that you're transitioning in this case, because they're almost always guardians. Um, the, the other big thing is, you know, uh, some of the adult docs aren't as good at kind of recognizing the guardianship. So depending on how, you know, how much that person can process and answer questions, they may try to push it as more the individual. Um, answering the questions and stuff. And of course, you know, we all have those parents that want to give all the information and um, don't, you know, don't feel that their child is given the right information or they're saying it a, di a different way. Um, but I think I sit down with the parents in this case and just kind of say, well, let's see what you guys need to, to be able to do with the new provider. 
um, and see if we can make up a list that you can talk to them about when you go for the new, you know, for the, for the uh, initial visit. Like, you know, we want to be available, but, you know, we'd like to have you have alone time, but we want to be available to answer questions because we're making all the decisions. So, so I do think you have to treat the parents just like you treat the person that you're transitioning. Right. So I'm not going to comment much on this um, beyond the tr following up with transfers. I do follow up with a lot of people with chronic illness when I send them elsewhere, especially um, eating disorders, things like that. And right now in the process of transferring two um, young adults are 27 with, who are on Suboxone. And um, I, what I told them was go visit the doctor once, come back and see me once, and then go on okay, at that point. You have a chance. If it fails, you can stick with me. If it doesn't, we'll try elsewhere at that point. But if it sticks, then or at least we did a warm turn up or handoff. Have the next case, please. Timothy's 20 years old. Timothy's blind. He has a low average IQ. He attends college, though, and he's getting a degree gradually. How do you empower him in the workforce? Um, how do you talk with him about sex, dating, relationships? <clears throat> um, so I'll, I'll take this first, uh, and then I can have Don follow up. So for me, I think a lot of what we do in adolescent medicine is empowering people. So if, I, I'm not sure how long I've known Tim, Timothy at this point, um, but how I would empower him with anything, but especially in the workforce would be having him list out his, the things that he's good at and the talents he brings to the table and what would make him marketable in the, work, in the workplace. Um, just to build upon those strengths, you know, because he's obviously going to know that the negatives and the insecurities are probably going to be around the fact of his vision and his IQ, but to build on the positives and to sort of come from there to say, oh, these are things that you could look at and things that you could possibly be very good at. Um, and then in pa uh, talking to him about sex, dating, and relationships is really just the same way that I talk to other people. Um, I think it's super important that all persons are able to experience these, the positive, well, mostly positive things that come along with sex, dating, and relationships. So I would just chat with him. I would see if he had any other, um, like any specific questions for me. I would say I would ask if he has a, um, a community, like if he knows other people um, that also suffer from blindness and if he's met them through some, through some venues and see if there's any possibilities there or, you know, I'm just thinking about when I'm saying this, I'm thinking about the deaf community and how really um, I've learned a lot about them randomly and how most some deaf people only want to be with deaf people. So to learn about that and, and it's just fascinating. And so to talk to him about it and to talk about um, what he's looking for and what his questions are and what his insecurities are and just try to help him and um, validate those concerns, but also really try to build on his positives and his strengths. So Brock, I want to interrupt and lob a couple more questions at you related to that. <laughs> so, and so we made up these scenarios or they're real scenarios. We've changed the ages, names, things like that. Um, but uh, let's say um, Timothy has not made a lot of friends through high school or college days, okay? Um, he turns to you and say, you know, I want to date. Okay. Um, do I, I go online? Okay. I found the various websites to do it. Do I disclose that I'm blind up front at the beginning of my communication or do I wait to know somebody farther in? Same thing with job application. Do I disclose right under my letterhead or do I wait till the interview? Um, so going back to the friends thing, people probably be able to realize I'm a strength based person. So I'd always talk about, I would focus on the friends he made and how he made those and what brought those friends into his life. Even if it were just a few, I would spend a little bit of time talking about why he thought it was hard with other people and maybe building on some positive that I elicited to help him build more friends. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the other question, whew, that's a hard one. I would say that I think that, um, I would ask him initially what he thought about it. I would encourage him. I'm thinking a little bit more about my transgender community in this scenario. And I, I always am proactive with them and have them tell their partners about their transgender identity um, before and early on. And I'm not equating being transgender to being blind, but I'm just thinking, you know, I think that that would definitely be a discussion that would need to happen early on and most likely pre-meeting them. Um, and I would sort of try to do that in a very sensitive way to describe why I felt that that was the most necessary thing. But ooh, it's a hard question. Don, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think you know, 
I think if they bring up the subject, I would be, you know, completely honest with them. And I think it's an invitation to talk about it. So I think it's a great thing for the young adult to do. Um, cause a lot of times they won't want to talk about that stuff. And, and I think it's more uncomfortable sometimes trying to bring it up than, you know, waiting for somebody to kind of say something and, uh, somewhat to Brock's thing. I mean, I have, um, transgender, um, you know, LQ, uh, by and trans and everybody with, you know, with a combination of they, they're on the autism spectrum or they have you know, a low IQ or, an, or a low average IQ. And so trying to kind of manage all of that for the kids that are typically developing and have all those things going on, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult thing. And I hope they would trust us to kind of talk about it. Um, but sometimes I'll bring it up as a subject as part of a well child visit, like, hey, let's talk about some of your relationships and stuff. And what are you thinking about? And, um, and sometimes that's an invitation from us to to say, okay, yeah, I was thinking about going online. What do you think about that? And, you know, so so either way, I mean, is it an important subject? Absolutely. Because I think sometimes we're the only person that can give them the information that they need um, or that they may trust to give the information. Um, Workforce-wise, I, you know, I agree with Brock, um, really to get strengths and then what you need for um, accommodations. Those are the things, like, what do you need in, a, in an office setting, you know, with, with uh, low visual acuity, you know, what, what is it that you're going to need for all these different adaptations to be able to do your job? Um, so I think that's important. And then what do you do really well? You know, what are some of the things you do well that we can kind of market to a, you know, potential employer? Um, so, and then, you know, the whole question about online dating and stuff, boy, I think that's a, you know, that's, a, that's a tough one. And I, I see Brock shaking his head. I'm like, I don't think so. I think it would be much better to go out and meet people first. Um, whether he tells his, you know, potential employer about, I mean, at some point you have to, and, you know, it, it is okay to say it up front because it's, it's discrimination if they don't hire, you know, if they can, if he can do the job, then it's discrimination if they, you know, if they use the blindness as a consideration. So he should know that he has some rights to be able to tell people, but he's got to tell them at some point because, he's going to need some accommodations and people are obligated to do those accommodations if he's able to do the job. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a more of saying, I think I'd be more upfront about it. Um, I'd certainly talk about the strengths first and then say, and by the way, I, you know, I have low visual acuity or I'm, I'm legally blind and I would need a few accommodations to do this job, but I can do this job. So those, those kind of things. Yeah. Blindness has added issues with it. Um, it apparently, somewhere between um, 80% of people who are blind do not find employment as easily, um, which is a yeah. frustration. And um, although they can apply for jobs, the application is in writing versus, you know, not writing. Exactly. There's all sorts of added hurdles that come with that one as well. I do think it's really important to note that one thing that I say blanket to all of my patients and especially to patients who have any type of disability is that sex dating and relationships should be fun and should be positive. It's really unfortunate that a lot of people have grown up with really negative thoughts on dating and relationships and what it's supposed to be like. And there are definitely people with physical disabilities that don't feel that they definitely, that they necessarily deserve to enjoy sex and dating and relationships. And I try to tell them that they, I mean, I do, explicitly tell them that this is something that should be enjoy enjoyable and positive in their life. Danielle, can we have the next slide, please? Case number four is Judy. Judy's 14 years old. Uh, she has Crohn's disorder. She presents for a well visit. Uh, what do you do to empower Judy to become involved with her own care? How do you get the parents to be partners with her? Um, so Judy is 14. So she's a young adolescent. So young adolescent is 11 to 14. Um, and so how I would really empower her. So she's a young adolescent with a chronic illness though. So I think I would really empower her in her care to sort of be the, the, I'd probably start with her being able to tell me what's going on with her subspecialist and what's going on with GI. And if there've been any um, changes or updates, I would um, empower her and uh, help her to learn her medicines. I think it's really interesting sometimes when you're in an exam room, you'll sort of be like, hey, Judy, what, what medicines are you on? And the mom or the dad will answer the question, including the doses. And I'm just like, and, and then in that moment, I sort of will use that actually as an example to sort of be like, Judy, do you know these? And are you able to answer this question if someone were to ask you? Um, and, and sort of do that in a sensitive manner, but just see that um, she knows what medicines she's on. 
I think it's interesting, the, the concept of allergies. I don't talk about that as much, but I, would, I like the idea of asking about allergies and then really what's going on with their GI care. Um, that's probably where I would start with empowering a 14-year-old. Um, and then how do you get parents to be, the, to be partners is just, for me, it's always just a discussion. You know, I think to say I'm an adolescent medicine specialist, the best thing that we know is that with a chronic illness is for you to be there and be involved and be positively involved, but also to empower Judy to take over her own care. Um, so I think it would be, that would sort of, it would just be a discussion with the parents. And, and I would say it would be an odd situation if a child had Crohn's and the parents sort of weren't involved in being partners. But I do think that there is this notion of helicopter parenting and we would want them to give a little bit of breathing room um, to Judy so she could learn her own care and learn sort of what's going on with her main subspecialist. I don't know if she has others, but with the gastroenterologist. And I, you know, so I, yeah, I would, I would agree with, you know, early on kind of talking about this and um, even at 14, 15, sometimes I'll start a conversation with a kid with chronic diseases about um, how's that going to look when you're heading off to college? And sometimes they're freshmen in high school and they're looking at me going, why are you talking about this now? I said, because you really need to, you know, you need to understand what's going on with your body and how to communicate that to people because, you know, you may be able to call your parents on the phone, but you're going to have to go to like a college health clinic or something local and try to uh, communicate what's going on with you. Um, and probably explain what your disease is um, because you may need to go to a walk-in care or something that you know may not have all your history. Um, but I do, but I do think it's there's a great time at 14 to start to have them do a little bit of their care and kind of gradually get the parents to relinquish it. Um, I think that's the goal is to really developmentally as they get more and more understanding of what's going on with their disease, then you keep trying to get the parents to back off a little bit um, and be involved with setting things up, but then let them go after. So yes, you should go to the college health uh, center and, and my wife works in college health. So we hear about this all the time. Go to the, you know, go and meet with the college health professionals that are there, talk about your disease, what, you know, typically what would be issues that needed to be um, taken care of while you're at college and stuff. And then when that child actually goes to college, you know, that's the time to really back off. But those are things I start introducing about this time is, is really, you know, trying to get the child and the, the teen themselves to um, take a, you know, take some ownership of what's going on and how to manage it. So although I think of Judy as having a lot more to learn about her health care because she has chronic illness, I'd also say kids with chronic health issues seem to be a little bit safer with risk taking. Um, that they tend to be more likely to be aware of condoms importance and birth control importance and things like that. Um, and so maybe it's been all their exposure to the medical system through the years, or maybe they actually do have some invested interest in their health. Yeah, we do know that adolescents, um, even young adolescents with chronic illness, have increased levels of anxiety. And not saying that it's necessarily negative, but to have that vigilance around your um, health care could sort of be a positive byproduct of the anxiety. Um, I do think that I just want to highlight something Don said, which I think is really important. I didn't say it's sort of when Judy were to come in, I think the very first question would be, you know, what is Crohn's? Tell me what that is. Um, and, you know, how, what were the symptoms that led to it? I think this happens to me all the time since I've moved um, to Maine. Someone will come, a 14 year old comes in with anxiety. And the first question I ask is, you know, what is anxiety? What are these? Because they'll say, I have anxiety in this. What is that? Explain that to me. Explain me what your symptoms are. So I think that's a really good point um, to ask them about that, not only what medicines they're on and stuff like that. Can we have the next slide, please? This is going to be a lightning round because of the fact we're running out of time. So uh, one sentence, two sentence answers. What's been your most challenging case for transition, or one of them at least? Who wants to go first? Um, I'll go first. I I was I did my fellowship at CHOP, and I just have this really um, I have this tendency just if someone's like, oh, this patient needs a PCP, the first thing I'm going to say is yes. Um, and I just really had just a very very medically complex patient that I had to. Um, I sometimes think being a PCP is coordination of care, but this was sort of just a lot a lot of coordination of care, and the mom did not speak English, um, and so there were just a lot of really big. Um, challenges in transitioning this patient, um, but that would probably be mine. Don? Okay, um, 
you guys, have, oh, I guess you're back now. Okay, I lost Brock there for a minute. Um, I just recently had one that um, wasn't that complex. So it was a 24 year old who um, I kind of got him through high school and, and the early part of college, um, ADHD, um, has some anxiety, uh, like so many um, individuals was smoking marijuana um, every night to fall asleep, went to Colorado so he could smoke it more, um, finally got him back here, um, worked with him on his ADHD, put him on, you know, we tried a number of different stimulants, put him on Adderall. And then I said at 23, 24, gee, you're stable. And this is one thing that I, I insist on is that for my ADHD kids is that, you know, I want you to be stable before I transfer you. I'm not going to transfer you to somebody and have them try to figure everything out. So this kid was very stable, had gotten a job, was very happy with his job, was moving down to mass. Um, so I said, great, this is a great time to transition. Let's talk about how are you going to do that? And so he, he knew he was going to transition um, in Massachusetts, but he decided, or his parents decided, one or the other, that they wanted him to have a doc up here. So they went to one of the local internists who totally kind of uh, belittled him and said, you can't be on Adderall. That's not a medicine that, that I'm going to manage, and it's a bad medicine, and you shouldn't be on it. Um, and so we got a phone call from the mom, actually. <laughs> so here's another helicopter parent. And her first thing was, you guys got him so stable and he's been doing so well. And then he went and did this and his self-esteem just went way down. So now we're in the process of trying to find a more appropriate doc to, um, to transition him to. And that may be in Boston because, um, because I'm thinking he'll probably get, you know, a little bit more consideration there. But it just, it just, raises the thing about stimulants and how some of the adult docs are really um, very uncomfortable with them and think, you know, I've, I've been told multiple times that they think they're gateway drugs um, and, you know, that Adderall should never be used and there's other medicines you can do and things like that. So that, that was really challenging because I felt bad for this kid because he was doing so well and I'm just hoping it's not going to set him back. In my one case would be um, eating disorder, since prize population. Um, is, there's room for growth and knowledge based in the adult world as far as eating disorders. And so when I pass people on, I, I worry about what's going to happen afterwards. Can I have the next slide? We're going to pass over this um, case six because we're out of time. But um, to make your office transition savvy, look at that change workbook. Can I have the next slide, please? And so your takeaways from that are hopefully transition is a slow process that starts in the early teen years and finishes with successful transfer when you're older. Um, proactively use language that empowers the teenager and makes the parents partners as part of the process. Develop relationships with offices that will accept young adults and meet their needs. Think about partners in your community, such as the main parent for iteration of the process and use the transition change package as a tool to help you in the process. Morgan, I pass it back to you. Oh, and before I do so, so well, this is uh, the second of three webinars. Our first one was the Well Adolescent, which Brock and myself did. Uh, this one, as you've heard today, um, thank you, Don, for joining us. The third one we're doing on December 3rd, it's on sexual risk taking in teenagers, solutions for the office, and Brandy Brown from the Gender Clinic at Maine Medical Center is gonna join us for that. We hope you will do as well. Morgan. All right, so I just checked the Q&A and the chat and it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, oh, actually one just popped up. Um, do you feel comfortable providing families and youth with IDD with info about applying for social security benefits by age 18 and getting onto waiver waiting lists? Don, I'm gonna love that one to you. <laughs> love that one to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, it's part of the discussion I have before they turn 18, whether they're on SSI or disability already, um, try to get them, um, you know, uh, hooked up with the right people to do that if they haven't done it. Um, and then now, now as, as a service that we provide through our, uh, through our program down here, we have a neuropsychologist that can do kind of um, evaluations on folks and see, you know, number one, should they qualify for disability or SSI? And number two, you know, what's the best way to go about doing that. The other thing is, is that if you qualify for SSI as an adult, you automatically get Medicaid. So, you know, that's really important for some of these folks who might lose their parents' insurance after 26. Um, so although they can keep them on, but they still, they have to have a disability that would qualify based on the insurance, um, but they can stay on there. All right, we had another question come in, or did you want to add I something? 
I, I was going to add, um, it, it's, it, before we cut off at some point, is um, it, with the survey information, if you give us any feedback in the format of this presentation, it'll be tremendously useful for our next presentation. So, but the last question. Um, we have one that says, what age will main care stop paying for pediatric visits? I don't, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they don't seem to uh, differentiate between whether somebody's 24 or 21. Um, I think the question I you're asking is when, get, yeah. when do you not become uh, eligible for main care anymore? <laughs> and the number of kids oh, fall is that the one? age 18. Um, and, and that's yeah. the one frustrating thing. All right, I think that's all we're gonna do for now so that we can close the webinar and you can do the evaluation. Um, our contact information is on the screen if you need to reach out to us for any, any reason. And on the next slide um, is all of our social media information. So be sure to follow Qualidime um, on the various channels to learn more about upcoming uh, education events. So Danielle's gonna go ahead and close this. Thank you guys so much for that great presentation. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you.